Uh, thanks, Rosie. No, I'm delighted to have made it here on time. The Hammersmith and City Line was running very smoothly this morning, even though it was a bit crowded. It's very nice to be here. I haven't spoken here uh, on this podium for just over two years. I spoke here just after the election when I was architecture minister, and I lasted as architecture minister for one day before the uh, portfolio was ripped away from me. But now normal service has been resumed. Uh, I am not only the Minister for Culture, Creative Industries uh, and uh, Communications, but also a Craft, as I have been for two and a half years, Heritage, Architecture, Design. So I feel a bit like the sort of pack horse of the government. I just keep plodding along and people add portfolios to me, which I think is a compliment in some ways. And I have uh, been a supporter of contemporary craft. I was lucky enough to grow up in a family where my mother is passionate about contemporary crafts, as I'm sure many of you know, and I was also delighted when uh, we came into office to offer the Crafts Council a space in my office. Uh, as some of you know, one of the great privileges of being a minister is that the government art collection arrives at your door within 24 hours uh, and curates your office. You may have a say in some of the art you're going to get, but it's very quickly made uh, clear that uh, your opinion is welcome but won't be uh, followed. Uh, you have the most wonderful art put on your wall, but I thought actually uh, I'd love to exhibit some craft as well. So we had two craft council tables with a rotating uh, display. So uh, I was delighted to do that, delighted as well to devote my brief tenure as a GQ columnist to devote one of my columns to the importance of contemporary craft uh, and its central role, I think, in uh, contemporary culture. Uh, as part of our own budget cuts, I've now moved out of my office, which was approximately twice the size of this room, uh, and we've now moved into the attic of DCMS, so I'm not sure there's going to be uh, room uh, for craft objects in my office, but we'll certainly display them in the communal areas. Uh, I want to echo what uh, Moira was saying about the Crafts Council, which does a fantastic job in promoting contemporary craft. It's been a great privilege over the last two and a half years to work with Rosie and her team, uh, the promotion of contemporary uh, craft, the people who make it, the collectors, the public, children and young people. Uh, we've managed to get craft into Downing Street now, which was another uh, hiatus which has been uh, uh, remedied. And there's now a contemporary craft uh, revolving exhibition in Downing Street as well. So craft is very much front and centre uh, of our cultural thinking. I think I was reminded that it's not just uh, us who uh, are taking contemporary craft seriously. The public love it. The power of making exhibition uh, at the v &A, uh, had exhibits. Uh, uh, Maura mentioned Shauna Richardson's uh, crotcheted lions. She had a crotcheted bear there. Matt Duran's moles. Uh, Julian Ellis, who I think is here, his embroidered surgical implants. And it was the most popular free exhibition uh, in the v &A's history. So I think that's uh, fantastic. And I think it's a testament to the craft community's skills and expertise and to the Craft Council's knowledge and networks that there's such a public appetite for learning about the process and products of making. Moira mentioned the difficult economic climate we're working in. I think one of the things I'd like to say to this audience, as I would say to any audience involved in the arts, is that however difficult the economic circumstances are, one of the things we must not do is lose our ambition uh, to make a difference. Uh, one of the things we did when we came into office, we had to make very painful decisions on funding, but we were able to restore the cuts to the lottery uh, to the arts. So lottery funding has increased substantially. Uh, the Arts Council recently announced its capital projects, and the lottery is also funding a range of other different important schemes. I commissioned Darren Henley to do a report on cultural education, uh, and we will be launching a national cultural education plan in the next few months. And again, we want to put cultural education at the forefront uh, of our children's experiences at school. And that will involve absolutely working with the Crafts Council and contemporary craft makers who are well placed to help us in our ambitions there. Uh, philanthropy as well, I think, is an important part of the mix. It's not there to replace public funding by any means, but there is a gap there. There's a gap in expertise and experience which we're hoping to fill with grant funding uh, and incentive funding. So there is, a, there is a hugely ambitious agenda that we're pursuing despite the difficult economic climate. 
But as Moira also said, one of my passions is technology, uh, and I see technology as being a massive opportunity for the arts in doing things differently, in reaching new audiences, in bringing the innovation that is so central uh, to the arts and arts culture uh, to, uh, to uh, thinking in technology. So if you look at some of aspects of contemporary craft, for example, the work that was profiled at the House of Commons last year by the Crafting Capital Report, it's clear that some of today's craftsmakers are deeply engaged in creating a dialogue between their work and technology. And of course, many people here today are makers, and many people here are at the forefront of this work. So what I'm saying will be absolutely familiar to you, but it's not yet as familiar to others outside the sector as it should be. So I just wanted to reflect, and use this opportunity to reflect on some of the facts that are perhaps less well known. So the recent report, Craft in an Age of Change, uh, surveyed more than 2,000 makers, retailers, educators, curators, and it looked at the place of craft in the creative economy and the working patterns of makers and other craft professionals. And of course, more than half of makers said that they were using digital technology, and most of those who were using it were using it often, or in fact, all of the time. And cutting-edge technologies like laser cutting and 3D printing have opened up new possibilities for makers. In fact, The Economist described 3D printing as the manufacturing technology that will change the world. And these kind of new technologies are among the new techniques and technologies widely used in universities and colleges and well used by the current generation of makers. But they're only part of the story. As I said, I'm keen to champion engagement between the arts and science, technology, engineering and manufacturing, what the government calls the STEM agenda. So I'm excited that makers are already working on a huge range of collaborations in this area and I'm delighted to be here to highlight their place amongst the true pioneers of the benefits of adding art to STEM, which of course makes STEAM. And I was delighted to see uh, David Willits earlier this year, the Science Minister, in a speech acknowledge the importance uh, of the arts to technology and I was delighted when we commissioned a report into skills for video games and visual effects that again the two authors of that report put the arts front and center of what are considered by most people to be technology industries but they absolutely acknowledge that those industries can't succeed without the arts. So the world's first tissue engineered organ transplant took place in July 2011, saved the life of a throat cancer patient. The glassmaker Matt Duran, who I think is here, played a crucial role in developing the technology behind the operation, creating moulds for growing tissue that could withstand a bioreactor. And as a result of this collaboration with the Royal Free Hospital, these moulds are now being used to develop tissue-engineered noses and other organs. And the longer this partnership continues, the more exciting the developments will be. And research has also shown how working side by side with skilled factory workers, makers can inject creativity into manufacturers to build new solutions. So for example, glassmaker Vanessa Cutler's work with water jet cutting companies has expanded the technical capabilities of an entire industry, while Trish Wood's work with pewterware manufacturers has helped to create new colours and finishes that appeal to modern buyers expanding market potential. And there are new scalable business models and profit to be made in this area. PricewaterhouseCoopers has projected direct profits of almost 3.5 million and royalties of about a million over 25 years for Resilica, a recycled glass resin composite developed by glassmakers Jim Roddice and Gary Nicholson. Katie Bunnell's Auto China system is providing customers with opportunities to personalise products in line with today's <coughs> consumer's desire and also to reduce warehouse costs and reduce environmental impact. And in all of these cases, it's the craft maker's specialist knowledge and skills which play a vital role in finding solutions to manufacturers' challenges. It's your understanding of materials, honed by years of intensive experience, means you can challenge manufacturers to push their processes far further than they thought possible. So these are just a few examples, but there are others. For example, textile designer Philippa Brock looking at the Internet of Things, the idea of machines communicating with each other, developing a smart fabric that connect people with their physical environment and with the Internet. There was the Ideas Lab that the Crafts Council organised with Watershed 
uh, last year, which brought together 60 makers, engineers, and technologists to explore new ideas. And that day showed the intense connectivity between craft and new technologies, and it created smart objects that, for example, could uh, enable the remote monitoring of health outputs. And I'm delighted uh, to announce today that Watershed is launching three new residences in partnership with the Crafts Council to take this work forward. It's a superb opportunity for three craft makers to undertake intensive periods of work embedded in technology labs in the southwest. The call for applications is going live online later today, and it's also been generously funded by the Esme Fairburn Foundation. And it's great to see that collaboration is also reflected by Watershed's presence as one of the partners uh, in this conference. So today at Assemble 2012, we'll explore the contribution that Kraft makes to innovation, to enterprise, the relationship between making, science, and technology. You're going to hear from uh, some superb uh, speakers looking at how uh, surgeons are learning from makers, look at the dynamic between making and synthetic uh, biology, uh, looking at the evolution of craft in, in a collaborative culture. We'll hear how focused interventions designed to connect makers with, science, makers with scientists, technologists and engineers can create new products and developments, and how vision and strategic investment bring about collaborations that can help to deliver government policies on innovation and growth. And it's not just the opportunities for new forms, products, or even aesthetics that are exciting here. It's the fact that they're so radically different from their predecessors, meaning that systems and processes underpinning them are themselves being reimagined. This work is intensive, and it's also expensive, and it needs cash. And I think that there are many ways that we can help fund this work, through organisations like Nesta, through the research councils, through the Technology Strategy Board, and also through industry. We're making progress, but I hope those bodies will look to see that they are doing everything they can to make themselves accessible to the people behind these initiatives, to sole traders seeking to earn a living and balancing these projects with others, perhaps less familiar with funding processes than others in the creative industries. The funds may be in place, but the honest brokers may still need to do more. And I mentioned earlier, uh, and Moira mentioned, Arts Councils, the Arts Council's policy for digital and creative content through its creative media policy. It specifically includes emerging and innovative practices that work across boundaries. It aims to support the work of artists, curators, and cultural producers to work with higher education, researchers, and technologists. It encourages the production of new creative content, product, and services. And it's a fantastic development, not least because it brings together organisations that haven't previously worked together but are now finding fantastic common ground. So as, as I said before, the people in this room and your colleagues are at the forefront of some very significant developments. You're adapting and using your knowledge in the 21st century to stretch the capabilities of materials and processes. We need your expertise and we need to use it in innovations in engineering, in science, and technology. Industry needs your understanding. It's a great time of potential for innovation in science, technology, and engineering, and I hope that you will play your full part in driving that forward. One of the things that I'm involved in at the moment are the efforts to save uh, the Wedgwood Collection. And any visitor to the Wedgwood Collection sees that Although we say that this is a new 21st century innovation to bring craft makers together with scientists, engineers, and technologies, technologists, in fact, it's as old, of course, as the Industrial Revolution. Wedgwood, a craftsman, began the Industrial Revolution, and he began it by bringing together craft and science. And I hope we can continue that tradition in the 21st century. Thank you very much indeed.